and our city people be teaching us lessons from God's Word uh, this evening through Sunday. And we look forward to those lessons. We appreciate Him coming and being with us and teaching us. Uh, I want to make mention of a few that uh, will not be able to be with us. Uh, some of our regular numbers that have been self isolating because of the pandemic. Some of the uh, older folks. Uh, <clears throat> but also, there's some in the parking lot. The Browns have been uh, exposed to someone who uh, has uh, coronavirus, so they will be uh, isolating in the parking lot, but they are here with us this evening. Uh, Brother Marcus, he's had a problem with his back. He's got some medication for that, and hopefully he will uh, get over that soon. Uh, also, I want to remember Brother Mike Tice and also Brother Chris Brakefield is there both recovering from uh, surgeries. Uh, we're missing several of our number. Hopefully, some of those folks will be coming in shortly to be with us. Uh, some of our members travel for work, and that might be hindering from that. Also, Brother Rodney uh, Broadhead is visiting away in Colorado, so that accounts for uh, his absence. Uh, leading our singing this evening being Brother Chris Brakefield, and uh, at the time he chooses to give call on Brother Darren Oldham to a word of uh, open prayer. And at the close of service, we'll ask Brother Brady Glaze if he will word to close in prayer. Mm -hmm. well, I haven't missed anything we need to mention is, uh, is there a man that has another announcement before we begin? If not, we'll begin with a song service with Brother Chris. Number 626 will be our first song this evening. I thought it's sort of appropriate maybe to begin with this song as we begin this series of lessons. Do all in the name of the Lord. As the first verse says there, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Let's sing all three verses and then we'll do it about it quickly. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do not in the name of man or priest, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name, do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed, as God decreed, do all in the name of the Lord. Be not deceived by worldly free, do all in the name of the Lord. The Spirit says in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in His name, do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed, as God be free, do all in the name of the Lord. Till toil and labor near our done, do all in the name of the Lord. Dear Christian friend, if you be one, do all in the name of the Lord. Do all in his name, do all in the name of the Lord. In word or deed, as God decree, do all in the name of the Lord. At this time, Brother Odom will lead us in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our most gracious and heavenly Father, we come humbly bow before you, giving you all glory and honor and praise, realizing that you are the great I am, the creator and the standard of life. 
And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you've blessed us with here in this world and for this day to be able to come together as your people to worship you in our word. We thank you, Father, for the Safe Travel Defenders, uh, bringing them up from Panama City to be with us and to work with us this weekend during this gospel meeting to help spread your word and to build one another up. And we pray, Father, that you be with Brother Fenner as he presents your word uh, Friday through Sunday, that you would be with him, Heavenly Father, and give him a ready remembrance of what he has studied, and may he present your word and handle your word aright. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we as Christians would be here and be attentive, and we would have open, heart, open hearts to take your word and apply it to our lives so that we can be better servants of mind, be better equipped to defeat the evil one and teach those around about us so that they too can enjoy eternity. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all the spiritual blessings you've placed upon us. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed in his resurrection. We know that we have hopes of being with you in eternity. What a great blessing that is, Father. We thank you for such, and we thank you for this avenue of prayer where we can come together as we have tonight or separately as individuals and pray to you, Heavenly Father, on behalf of ourselves and others. And we pray for some of our number that was mentioned here tonight, Father, that are not with us, that are uh, fearful of this pandemic or maybe traveling or maybe sick or recovering from surgery. Pray that you be with each and every one and restore them back to their health. We ask you, Father, to forgive us for our shortcomings. We know that we are there times that we fail you. We pray that you would be with us and forgive us, help us to seek for your forgiveness and turn away from sins, and help us to be uh, diligent about turning away from those sins, Father, and serving you. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to be with our nation, be with us as uh, we will have men that will be elected to be uh, leaders of our nation shortly. We pray that you would uh, help us to have leaders, Heavenly Father, that would allow us to live peaceable lives and lives that would uh, reverence you. And we can come together as we have tonight and in the future to worship you without the fear of outside interference. We pray, Heavenly Father, to keep us safe in your care. Be with us and be with us as we study through your word. In Christ's most holy name we pray. Amen. 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 Turn, if you would, to number 812. Please turn to 812. All things are ready. And place your marker there. After Brother Finner's lesson is in, we'll plan to sing this song as a, a song of encouragement. Now let's turn to number 658. 658. All the way, my Savior, lead me. We'll sing all three verses and then we'll have our lesson this evening. 658. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt His tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divine here by faith in Him to dwell. For I know, whatever be called me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know, whatever be called me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each one, path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with a living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, though a stream of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, though a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of His love. Perfect friends to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit, with hope immortal, 
Wings that fly through realms of day. Lifts my soul through endless ages. Jesus, led me all the way. Lifts my soul through endless ages. Jesus, led me all the way. Brother Finn. begin this evening by saying thank you for having me this week or this weekend. Uh, you know, I we, I remember, I, I don't remember the tent meetings that went on for weeks and weeks and I don't remember the two weeks, but I always remember the weeks. And we had the weeks and Brother Pope said that y'all used to have the weeks, but I've seen it through my time as a preacher go from a week long to a weekend, or a Sunday through Wednesday, or a Sunday through Tuesday. I was involved one time when we were in Louisiana. I was involved in a one-day meeting. We had a one-day meeting. It was kind of like a lectureship, and everybody was there, and we started like early, pretty early in the morning and went through the afternoon. And so they kind of got a little bit different. you know. And, and people sometimes say they don't do a lot any good, but I think they do. I think maybe the good has changed a little bit, used to be that you would be able to have those converted and you would find, you know, it would not be unusual for you to find, you know, several people that are converted during a meeting or be baptized during a meeting. And uh, and it's kind of gotten to the point where that doesn't happen as much anymore. We wish it would and we hope it will this weekend. But as we think about that as well, that I, I believe, to me anyway, they are a great encouragement to those who are members of the Lord's Church. And I, I, I appreciate meetings. I know sometimes people even like to get away from what we don't need to do. Don't need to waste our money, even, somebody might say. But, um, but I, think they're, I think they're good. I think they're helpful for us as well. And I, and I thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given me uh, at this time to come together and, uh, and, uh, and that, we could, uh, that we could meet for one. You've been helping me for a while, and I appreciate that so much. And I, I feel uh, wrong if I didn't say thank you. I appreciate that so much. You know, it, it affords me the opportunity. You know, being down in a small congregation like we are, uh, I guess you the way to put it, just feed my family, and uh, and, and I thank you for that. I hope that the things that I have chosen to talk about this week. Uh, this weekend, I hope that they'll be beneficial to everybody uh, as we go through them and as we look at them. As I said, I, I tried to pick a few things that would be something that maybe we could, as we talk about, that would be beneficial to those who are Christians and for those who are not Christians. And, and hopefully that will be the case. And so if whatever, the, whatever the case be, if you're here with us this evening and you're not a member of the body of Christ, we're going to urge you to make your life right before God today. This evening before you leave leave our presence. And if it be that maybe sometime during the night that you uh, make that decision, I'm available. I don't know about them, that if they, the owners, if they uh, want their phone to ring real late, but I'm sure they wouldn't mind if that's the reason. Uh, but if you if you uh, feel that you would like to become a Christian, I would be happy to come and to meet you and to baptize you to Christ. And I know there would be others here as well. But as we do that, as I said, if those things that we have to say today or this, uh, this evening will be, you know, will, will prick your heart to do that. We want to urge you to make that decision that you might become a member of God's body and that, that then you might have a hope of going to heaven after you die. And then if perhaps as a Christian, maybe we've not been doing the things that we're here and we've come and maybe we've not been as committed to the Lord as we ought to, that, that we make that decision to recommit, I guess we would say, because we did one time, but to recommit our life to God, to do the things that God will have us do, and if you would like the prayers of this congregation, that we'll have an opportunity at the end 
uh, of invitation that if you need the prayers of this congregation, I would like the prayers or help of someone here that they would have that opportunity to do that as well. But we want to talk to you if you have the desire to talk about the Bible, to study the Bible. Maybe you're uh, here and maybe even be doubtful whether or not you're right before the Lord. That we would like to talk to you about that as we go through. And as we said, I hope that everything or the things that we have to say this evening will be beneficial in whatever capacity that that might be. This evening in our lesson together, I want to bring a lesson I've simply called a challenge to godliness. You know, being a Christian, being godly, somebody will say that, you know, it's not easy, and I would, I would pretty much agree with that, that it's not easy being a Christian. It's many times not easy to come to the decision that we want to, want to become a Christian. And then after we become a Christian, that there are so many things around about us that that uh, occupy our time and there are friends that we have that are not living right and we have to uh, we have to talk to them many times about why we live the way we live and, and many times we get uh, we get ostracized for doing that people don't understand it and so there are challenges to being God I want to use a Bible a, a scripture this, this evening to talk about some people that I think face those challenges that I think will help us in some degree and look at their process by which they lived and by which they made those uh, made those decisions. If you have your Bibles, ask you to turn over the book of Joshua, the 24th chapter. In Joshua chapter 24, I think it lays out to really a, a, a good outline of what took place there. Now, we're very familiar with the question that Joshua asked, the statement that he made in the place that he asked. But he says, but for me and my house, well, or he says, you know, if it seems undesirable, you choose for you this, this day whom you will serve, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, that's kind of something that all of us, you know, we go into homes sometimes and they'll have that plaque uh, there on their kitchen table or they'll have it hanging on the wall or whatever that as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. But I want us to go back and I want us to begin with the first part of the chapter. And I want us to see on what basis Joshua is going to ask the people that question. And to see really that it's not any different than the decision that we have to come to and the things that we have to think about in that sense. Go with me first of all over to Joshua chapter 24 and verse, 13, or verse 1 through 13. Before we get to that idea or that question that he asked, that he begins by talking about some things about their past. And so within the third, first 13 verses, he's going to review their past. He's going to review where they came from and where they are right now and on, on what basis he's going to ask them to answer the question that he asked. Verse 1, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of, uh, other side of the river in all times, and they served other gods. And then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau, and to Esau I gave uh, the mountains of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children went down to Egypt. Also, I sent, I sent Moses and Aaron and plagued Egypt, according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. And then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to, you came to the sea, and the Egyptians pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen of the Red Sea. And so they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, brought, you up, brought the, the sea upon them, and they covered them, and your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. Now let's stop there for just a minute. You know, we kind of passed over that a little bit. He begins to talk about where they were and where they started. And he says, I brought you out of, the, out of Egypt. He goes through and he talks about how that he had, uh, they crossed the Red Sea. And all those things are things that really stick out in our mind. And probably if we've been a, a part of the church or any time that we've been to Bible class and those are stories. That we've, that we've heard from our childhood about, you know, the part of the Red Sea and everything. But I want us to look at something real quick 
that I think that sometimes it's said we pass over, but it packs a lot of punch. He says there, as he, as he goes through those things, he said, then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. Now there's a couple things about that. One, one reason why they had to dwell in the wilderness a long time. But the second thing to understand that all of that time that they did dwell in the wilderness, that God was taking care of. It wasn't just a matter of him bringing them up to the Red Sea for them, him bringing them out of the land of Egypt, first of all, and bringing them there and, and taking care of them, but he took care of them a long time. He was very patient with the people of Israel. The people of God, they, they ridiculed him. They didn't want to do what he said the very time that you know, he finally brings them out of the land of Egypt. And they began to gripe, they began to complain, and they say, well, you know, God, you just brought us out of, out of Egypt just to kill us out here. You know, you, you're, not, not direct words, but the idea is, you just brought us out here to toy with us. You just wanted, you just wanted to watch us die. They came up to the Red Sea, and they said, okay, this is it. We're never going to get across. And so God made a way for them across the Red Sea, and you would think, as they crossed the Red Sea, they got on the other side. Perhaps they turned around. They watched all the soldiers, the Egyptian soldiers, die in the, in the sea. You would think that they would say, all right, we're with you, God. We're going to go and we're going to do everything you say. And you're not going to have a bit of trouble out of us. But that's not what happened. Is it? it wasn't long after they got on the other side that they began to complain and they began to grumble and and, you know, they didn't have any water, and they didn't have any food, and they didn't have the right kind of food. They wanted something different than, than uh, what they had. And they just continually complained and complained and complained. And finally, they get to the, they get to the promised land, and they say, well, we want to send these supplies over here, and we want to spy out the land. And God said, okay, you can do that. And, and so, they, but he was with them all that time until they go across it. And there are 12 spies, and 10 say, oh, we can't take that land. And two said, oh, yes, we can. And uh, that Moses sided with, of course, the majority, and they didn't go over. And so God says, okay, trip canceled. This trip's over. For you, anyway. For all of those, uh, for all of those men, of course, that were fighting of age, they were not able to enter into the promised land. But you know what? God was still with them in the wilderness. He still provided for them. He took care of them. Yes, the promise that he made to them that they would go to the right, go over to the promised land, but he said, no, you're not going to be able to do that. But yet, God still provided for his people. Still cared for them. Still had mercy on them. Now, let's continue our, let's continue our reading there just as we go through verse 8. He said, And I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan. And they fought with you, but I gave them into your hand that you may possess their land that I destroyed, or, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, uh, arose to make war against Israel and sent, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse them. But I would not listen to Balaam, therefore, therefore he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. And then he went over to the Jordan, and he came to, again to Jericho, and the men of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the, Je uh, the Gergeshites, the Hivites, the Je Jebusites, but I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out before you also, the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword, nor with your bow. I have given you a land for which you did not labor, and cities which you did not build, and you dwelt in them, and ate the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. And so he been with them all that time. He brought them up to the promised land. He was with them. He provided for them. He gave them provisions. He gave them water. He gave them food. He fought for them, if you will. They finally get to the other side, and God still takes care of them. He says, you know, you've come, you've come in the land and those houses, you know, I, dri I drove them out. Yes, there was work they had to do to do that. But they drove them out, and it says there that, 
you know, I, I gave you the land. It was there. You, you know, it was already there. It was ready made for you, if you will. That you, that you came in the land, you didn't labor for it, that you, that you had cities, you didn't have to build the city, you, didn't, you know, you just came, came in, you did basically, the idea is you just moved in, there were the vineyards out there with all the provisions that you needed to eat, and you didn't even have to plant them. Once again, you, they had to work to, to go and to, to you know, to, to uh, gain or to get the, the, the things to eat. So there are things they did, but they didn't plant those vineyards. And so as we think about it, I, I, the, the first thing that we understand as we go through that uh, Joshua is going to ask him the question about serving the Lord based on some things that he just said there in the first 13 verses. You remember as we go we go to the, the Ten Commandments, that as you as you look at the Ten Commandments that they are that they are given later on, that uh, um, later on, as, as we go through, or before, excuse me, but as we look at we look at those Ten Commandments, those Ten Commandments are based on something as well. And really, they're the same thought there. And I don't have a, 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 a verses up there, but in Exodus, the 20th, 20th chapter, and in verse, verse 1, it says, And God spoke all these words. He says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image, any likeness or anything that is in heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And so he goes through, he says, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of Egypt. I'm going, and he says, I'm going to make some, make some commandments of you. I'm going to not ask you some things, but I'm going to tell you, these are the things you are, you need to do. He says, I am the Lord your God. I brought you out of the Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Based on that, the idea is you don't have any other gods before. I have brought you out. It wasn't those foreign gods that brought you out, but God says, I have brought you out of the land of Egypt. I'm going to give you some commandments, some really some easily, easy things for them to do based on what God had already done for them. I'm, I, I'm, your, I'm your God. Well, Joshua goes through that here in this text, and he talks about what God had done. A review of the past. A review of the past. This morning, if, or this evening, if you're here, I think that as we go about it, we try to make that decision as to whether or not that we're going to be a Christian, that we're going to be a child of God, we need to review our past. And we need to go back and we need to think of where we were. Where we were without promise. And ask ourselves really the same question that Joshua was going to ask in just a few minutes. Very familiar passage of Scripture over the book of John, the third chapter. I remember, we don't see it much anymore uh, today and I think it's very telling that we don't. But used to, and when I used to watch football or any sport, it would be almost that every game you would see somebody hold up John three sixteen, and most people at least to some degree knew what it meant. Maybe a lot of people didn't as well, but but a lot of people knew knew what that said. Maybe didn't know what it meant. Maybe not. Maybe didn't know how to, how to obey it, but they knew what it said. But of course, he makes that statement in John chapter 3 and verse 16. He says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I don't want to say much tonight about that and uh, we kind of get back to our lesson, but the idea of what it says there, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, who, whosoever believes. The word belief, and he speaks of that within the, within the text as well. But the idea of belief has to do with obedience or a belief or a mental assent conjoined with obedience. And so that's what he says to these people. That whoever believes in him should not perish but ever bless. Sometimes we look at the word should and we, we, we explain that and I think rightfully so. We say what well, says should and then say they will. It says they should. They should because of what they believe. And I don't discount that idea. But the word belief is, is having a mental ascent, a mental belief about it, but also that that mental belief is conjoined with obedience. And so, yes, for God so loved the world, whoever believes in him, whoever believes mentally and conjoins that with the obedience of what he says, they're going to be saved. 
Well, as I said, that we have a lot, we have a real hard time explaining that to people because that's not how that generally people understand the word believe. Uh, as we go through the Greek language is a very uh, much more precise language, as we all know, than the Eng English language. And so we learn more about the word believe as it's used back in the, the Greek language than what we use it in the English language. Now we can learn the same thing in the context, can't we, about, about uh, obedience as well. But anyway, what I want to say about that verse tonight is this. That's history. That's our history. When we are asked whether or not we ought to become a Christian, are you, if you're not a Christian this, this evening, are you going to become a Christian? Well, as we think about that and as we ask ourselves that, that question, weigh the options. Weigh the reasons. Why should I become a Christian? Well, I should become a Christian because God so loved me that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's why I have to obey God. That's why I today ought to become a Christian. Because He loved me so much that He gave His Son. And if anybody has ever lost the son, they know how important it is that your children stay with you. And yet he gave himself. He gave up his son willingly, voluntarily. And I can't ever, I can't imagine any father ever voluntarily say, Here is my son. Take him and kill him for somebody else. That's why we ought to become Christian. Because I look at the past and I see what God did for me. And I see what He gave up for me. Now, turn over just a little bit over to the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 5. I'm sorry. In Romans chapter 5, and in verses 6 through 8, look at the people that He says. He gave up his son Paul. In Romans chapter 5, verse 6, he said, For when we were still yet are still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So it wasn't that he was dying for good people. It was that he died for everybody. He died for the good, yes. Those that were trying to live according to the law of Moses, as he was, uh, that, that those that were had done so before, those that were Christians as they were here in the book of Romans and trying to live their life as they ought to, that, that he died for all of them. He died for the ungodly. If you turn over the book of Romans, the third chapter, verse 23, there's a statement that's made there that many times we look at that statement, and I think sometimes that we have not felt the full weight of that statement. He says for, uh, he said there in verse 23, he says, for all have seen and fallen short of the glory of God. Now the book of Romans, if you look at the book of Romans and you'll think uh, about why it was written, it was written to show that very fact that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, as he talked about that, he wasn't talking to them individually. A lot of times when we take that, we, we, we look individually, we say all have sinned, we say Roy Fenner has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that's true. I don't, you know, I'm not saying that that's not true. But, you know, we look at that as I say, we individualize that. But what God is trying to, uh, trying to point out through the Apostle Paul is he's trying to point out the Jews had sinned, the Gentiles had sinned, and everybody on earth needs Christ. And that, that Christ died for everybody on earth. And what he's doing there is he's saying, you know, he died for the Jew who look at what he did, what they did, they put him on the cross. He died for the Gentile who cared nothing about Christ, who thought nothing about him, who didn't believe he was anybody 
uh, religious at all. He died for those who killed him. He died for those who didn't care anything about him. He died for everybody. Yes, he died for me individually. Yes, he died for you individually. But he died for every group of people, every person on the earth. And he did it while they were sinners. And that's what he's trying to prove there in the book of Romans. Jew, you're just as much a sinner as the Gentile. You know, that was the, that was kind of the, the uh, idea on the earth at that time that the Jew thought because, of course, that they were God's chosen people in the Old Testament, that that gave, gave them to some degree some kind of superiority over the Gentile who became a Christian, uh, who became a Christian uh, from, from that aspect of life. But he's trying to prove, no, you're not any better than anybody else. Nobody's any better than anybody. Everybody needs Christ, and he died for everybody. And so when we think about that question, when we ask that question, and as we as we go through that, we, uh, we look at that, think about the past. Are, are we going to be a Christian? Are we going to become a Christian? What Christ did for us. Well, the second point that I want to look at in the next couple of verses there, based on that, Joshua is going to say that there are going to be some requirements that, I, that you're going to be asking. Look at verse 14. Now, therefore, I had someone a long time ago tell me that when you see the word therefore, you need to look and see what it's there for. What's well, there for, what he said. Now, therefore, fear the Lord. Why? Because God, look at what God just did for you. Look at what God did for you. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which, were, uh, which your father served on the other side of the, uh, of the river in, in Egypt, serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you, now some translation, if you may have a translation that says, if it seems undesirable to you, I like that word. Because that's really, yeah, that, just, that just means, I mean, that means so much. If everything that God has done for you you look back at these people specifically as they look back and they say, oh, so all those things that God had done for them, if that seems undesirable, you know, go with it. Make your choice. Decide what you want to do. If the fact that God died or God sent His Son, He loved us so much and He died for us, that we can have a hope in heaven if we simply believe Him, not only have that mental sin, but with that we're obedient to those things that he tells us to do. If, if that seems undesirable, you just, you just go wild. You choose what you want to do. But he's going to say something here in just a few minutes about that choice. But he makes the statement there, as he said, once again, as you go back, he says, and if it seems evil to you serve, to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of, of the river, are the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, as he goes through that, he, he, he looks, if, if it seems undesirable to, to serve a God that did all of this for you, then you just choose for yourself who you're going to serve. Whether you're going to serve those dead gods that you had to, you had to go and you had to, you had to go cut down the trees, and you had to build you an idol there, or you had to go and you had to get the jewels, and you had to de decorate the idol, and you had to put sticks on it so you could pick it up and you can move it from place to place. And you had to tell the idol what to say, what you know, what to command, if you will, which wasn't a command at all, but you had to tell the idol what to tell you to do. You go ahead and you choose those gods, but you understand something. It's the idea of this. They needed to understand that those were dead gods. Those gods could do nothing for them. They were just, they were just idols. They were a, a sense of, I would suggest, and I and I liken it much today as denominationalism, that to a large degree, what denominationalism is, is the same thing as idolatry, that when man wants to do something, they're going to find a way to make that right from God's eyes. And so what happened in this country? Their denominations have started. We want to do this. Okay. This man said you could. Now that's not what that was good. That wasn't their exact reason. But you know, that that's, was it. This man says you can do that. 
Or we're going to say that this man said you could do it. He's dead, and we don't know what he said. We don't know what he really thought, but this is, this is what he said. You see those idols? They came up because the, because the people, even in Israel, started, started serving them as well. But people wanted to do things. And they made a God to say it's okay. But Joshua basically, he said, those gods are dead. They can't do anything. I'm the one, he says. God says, I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. I'm the one that's been with you all this time. I'm the one that brought you out of the Red Sea. I'm the one that was with you. I'm the one that fought all these fought all these enemies. I'm the one. I'm the one that planted these vineyards. I'm the one that has these houses. I'm the one that has this land that you don't have to build. I'm the one that you need to serve. Is what God is saying, basically. It's based on those things. Now, turn with me over to a couple of scriptures here. First of all, in 1 Kings chapter 18. And I just want to go through and, and just, just very quickly this first one. And then I want to go specifically to the New Testament because that's what we're trying to apply these things to. But 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, verses 16 through 39. It says, it speaks there, it says, Now therefore send, send rather all Israel to Mount Carmel and 450 uh, 50 prophets of Baal and 400 uh, prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. And so Ahab sent all the children of Israel and gathered all the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? Now, it wasn't really necessarily two opinions in the sense that the one was, was, the, was the, you know, it was God. He said, how long will you fall between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If they'll follow him. But the people answered and said not a word. And so what they do, and we're not going to read the rest of, the, the rest of our uh, section there, verse 39. You know the story there about Elijah and about the gods of Baal and how the gods of Baal could not, uh, could not uh, 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 burn the altar. And so what, what happens is that there's this altar that they build and, and you know, that Elijah... Or the people couldn't burn theirs, and there, you know, it was just, it's kind of a humorous story to read. You know, as as you know, the gods of Baal are calling to their gods, and you know, there's Elijah back there. I can just almost see just back there, just kind of laughing to himself and saying, "Hey, why don't you talk a little louder? Maybe he's not listening to you. Maybe your gods aren't listening. Maybe you ought to talk a little louder. And you know, well, maybe you maybe you ought to do this. Maybe you know, y'all aren't trying hard enough. You keep on going." You know, let's, let's cut ourselves and let's, you know, let's just figure ourselves. Maybe, maybe you're not doing enough, to, you know, to, to appease the, the gods. It's always just a kind of a humorous story. But anyway, then Elijah comes up and he his altar burned. They've taken the water. They put it around the altar the altars there that Baal had made, or the gods uh, or the people that serve Baal, and those are burned. And so what happened? They realize and they understand that, yes, as we were talking a minute ago, they're serving dead gods. God is an active God. And so what we need to do is we need to make, we need to make a decision to serve God, serve the active God. <laughs> Those are the two opinions. Now, if you will, go with the book of Acts, the second chapter. And I want us to, I want us to carry through just real quick in the, the book of Acts, the second chapter. In Acts chapter 2, we began looking at, and what we find, first of all, in the first part of chapter 2, there are some things about what took place on that day, and there are the prophecy that was made of Joel, and there is the sermon that is preached there as we go through. It says that Peter is standing up with the eleven. Now, what I want to say, say about this real quick in verse 14, that the Bible says that Peter stood up with the eleven. So what you have there is you have Peter being the spokesman, if you will. We often say what Peter said. We say Peter's sermon. And yeah, it was Peter's sermon in the sense that he spoke up. But he said he spoke up with the eleven. What that shows me is that shows within that message, that so shows unity. Even though Peter said it, that he was the one that came out or he was the one that spoke it or that preached it. The eleven stood up with him and they at the end, the end of it when they're asked this question, if you go back go down to verse 36, 
They heard the sermon. They say, therefore, let all the house of Israel assure that God has made this Jesus and be crucified both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the, uh, cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and, bre men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If there was any doubt with any of the apostles, and if there was any disagreement, with what Peter said, now would have been the time for one of those 11 men to stand, stand up and say, oh, but Peter, wait a minute. You can say the sinner's prayer and it'll be okay and you'll be saved. He didn't say that, did he? Nobody said that, did he? He didn't say that. One of them could have stood up and said, you know what? I, I agree that you need to believe and I agree that you need to repent and I agree with the hearing and the confession. But you know what, Peter? I think you've gone too far when you've asked the people to be baptized. That's not required of them. They don't have to be baptized. They can if they want to. But they don't have to be. Nobody said that, did they? Back home, when I'm teaching class, and I do it, and they know, they know, they know me. I've been there long enough, they know me. But I'll, I'll present something. And it may be something that's somewhat controversial. It may not be. And I'll say, any questions? Anybody have any questions? Any comments? And nobody will say anything. And I say, you sure? And nobody will say anything. I say, well, I'm going to assume everybody agrees with me. But that may or may not be the case. But I, say, I, would, I would say that that's the case here. Because nobody stood up. And nobody offered any other, any other option because there is no other option. But nobody offered any option of anything else to do that all of the apostles were unified in the message that what you need to do based on the gospel being preached, based on the fact that Jesus came and he died on the cross, based on that idea, what you need to do is you need to do exactly what Peter said. And that was a message that was preached from that time throughout the Bible till today. It has not changed. It will not change. It will never become anything else if we want to be accepted from God. Never. So the day that we die, anybody that tells us anything Except that we need to be that we need to that we need to repent and be baptized after hearing the gospel, which I believe we know they did. Peter stood up with the rest of the apostles. They stood up, and we know that they that they believed the message because here were three thousand later that they become a Christian. Well, why within the world would they be baptized if they had not believed? They believed it. Why would they even ask? You know, they didn't. You know, they were asked because they believed it. Well, what do we do now? Well, that was basically in and of itself a confession, wasn't it? We believe that Christ is who he says he is. We believe that, that he is the Messiah. And so we believe that we believe what you say, Peter. We believe what everybody's in agreement with here. And so we believe it. Now tell us what to do. That was a confession, I believe. And so Peter told them from where they were, where they stood, after hearing. Believing and, and confessing told them you need to repent and be baptized. And there's that conjunction and there, it's not one or the other, it's both. And all the apostles were in agreement with it. And whoever has told us before now or after now, anything else that we need to do in order to become Christian is wrong. They're wrong. And I hate to say that sometimes, but that's really basically all we said. They're wrong. It's not Bible. And it's not what God wants us to We can't be saved on that basis. And so when we began thinking about commitment, are we going to be committed to what God said? Or are we going to try to look for other things, other means, other ways? You see what they did in the Old Testament? They tried to serve other gods. They tried to serve the Baals. And, the, and Elijah showed them they're, they're no good. They're not, you know, they had they had nothing. They're not active. And so we see there was there was the case, and there's what that. Now look at verse 39. He said, For the promise to you 
and your children and all those who are far off as many as the Lord our God will call. And with that, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, uh, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And then he says, Then those who gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Oh, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if 3,000 people even came, especially that they would, they would come and they would obey? Now, just real quick, I've read in places that around the temple, that's where they were on the day of Pentecost, that standing room in the temple was 50,000 people. So if you think 50,000, 3,000 became Christians, that we, we don't like to look at it that way. But I said 3,000 souls were added to them. But that's a great number. But then look what happened. As we, as we go a little bit further, verse 20, uh, verse um, as we go through, we see there that they continue there, steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking bread and prayers. And then those that were uh, uh, those that were being saved were added to the church. And so we see that continue on. But look as we go to the, uh, chapter 26. In chapter 26 and verse 28, it says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And Paul, uh, Paul said, I would to God that that not only you, but that all that hear me today might become uh, become all most and all together such as I am, except for these chains. And when he said these things, the king stood uh, stood up, and well, the governor and Bernice and, and those who uh, uh, those who sat with him, and when they when they came and stood on side, they they uh, they talked again uh, among themselves, saying, "Excuse me." This man is doing nothing serving uh, or serving of death uh, for these chains. He doesn't, he's not doing anything wrong. And Agrippa said, said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appeared to, to Caesar. And so there, here they are. They've been taught. Agrippa, he, he did it. You know, he almost he persuaded me to be a Christian. I hope. That today, if you're not a Christian, that hopefully some of the things that I have to say might be, might persuade us, but that they might be something that we decide that is the right thing to do based on the evidence, based on what God did, not because I said them, not because of any any reason, not because of who I am or what I am or any you know. Not because of how far I traveled or whatever it is, but you obey because of what the Bible teaches, because of their requirements. You see, Agrippa, he just didn't follow their, their requirements. Well, then as we go through, we see that there's a problem. There's going to be a problem that's going to arise. They're going to ask, that, well, what are we going to, what should we do? Let's look at verse 16. Go back to our text in the book of Joshua. In Joshua chapter 24, um, and verse 16. He says, So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Joshua says, You know, choose this day whom you're going to serve. And they stand up and they and, and they answered right, didn't they? Shouldn't that be far be it from us? We don't have any other thing, to, we don't have anywhere else to go. We don't have anybody else to believe. We don't have anybody else to do anything for us. God's the one that's brought us out of Egypt. God was the one that did all these things in the first 13 verses. We don't, you know, we don't have, we don't have any, any other answer. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should serve, that we should forsake the Lord and serve the gods. For the Lord our God, He is He brought us out and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who did these great signs in our sight. And preserved us in in, uh, in the way that we uh, that we went among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove us drove out from before us all the people, including uh, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We will serve the Lord, for He is our God. Now look at it real quick. Look at verse twelve. Well, it's just amazing, almost. But I think if we look at it in context, that what He's saying. But Joshua said to the people. After going through and saying, you need to choose whom you're going to serve, you make this decision, you understand what God has done for you, he says to them in verse 19, you cannot serve the Lord. But Joshua, I thought that's what you wanted us to do. 
I thought you wanted to serve God. What do you mean we can't serve the Lord? Look, He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your trans transgressions from your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve the foreign gods, then He will turn and do harm and consume you after He's done good to you, or done you good. I think what Joshua was saying, and maybe you put it in play, might, we might say it, is Joshua said, you better, you better, if you're going to make this decision, you better think about it. You realize that God expects a commitment. When you decide that you're going to be a Christian, it is not a decision that we take lightly. And by no means am I trying to convince us, as Joshua is doing, that I would be trying to convince somebody to become a Christian, be baptized into Christ, and then say, oh no, and then try to discourage somebody. But what I believe that we need to do, as I think what Joshua is trying to do, is get people to understand it is not something that we take lightly. It's something that we better think about, and we better be committed to. Now, God, over in the book of Ecclesiastes, you remember one occasion that he says that he says that if we bow, bow, bow to God, that basically he says we, we better repay. Him. I think that's what Joshua was saying. If you're going to if you're going to decide, if you're going to bow to God, and you're going to say you're going to do something, you better do it. Don't take it lightly. I use that passage a lot in, in marriages, and that's not what he was talking about necessarily, but I, but I think that it's a good thing to put in marriages, especially the way marriages are falling apart. That when we get married, and usually when somebody makes a decision that they're going to get married, that I'll, I'll talk to them beforehand uh, and, and show them what the Bible says beforehand about that. For one, because during the ceremony, usually the bride and groom don't listen to anything the preacher says. So that's why you go before and you talk to them. But so many people get married today, and then one of the ideas they say, well, you know, we'll, we'll try it for a while. If it, does, if it doesn't work, you know, we'll, you know, we'll separate. It's no big deal. I, I watch this show on TV. Sometimes they have the um, a 90 Day Bride or whatever, or Married at First Sight, and things like that. And they go through this experiment. And they have different uh, different levels of this experiment that they have. Marriage is not an experiment. And being a Christian is not an experiment. It is a decision that we make, that we must be committed to, that we have decided that we are going to live the way God wants us to live. Turn to the book of Romans, the 12th chapter. A couple of scriptures real quick. In Romans chapter 12, and there are a couple of places we can look at Romans. In fact, I want to, uh, in chapter 6, when he says, There will be you not know that as many as been baptized into Christ or baptized into his death. Well, he's not talking about there. And we use it for that sometimes, and I think rightfully so. We talk about the mode of baptism is the burial. Well, that's true that it is. But, but the point of the scripture, he's talking to those who are Christians. And his point of the scripture is. He says in verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him through, through death, just as Christ was also buried. And the Lord said, Even so we should walk in the of life. He's trying to show us, or trying to show the Romans there, uh, the, the church there, that when you are baptized, you're baptized into his death, but you're raised to walk in the of life. That when we become a Christian, that we're raised, and there's a new way of living. That we put off the old, we put on the, the new. We, we, we're living differently. Now, it does some things about that as well, but we might use it for, for uh, different reasons. We all look at the mode of it, different things as well. But he's trying to show them, you live. You've got to live different. You can't just keep on living the way you live. You live different. Now, Pastor Caleb, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, when we look at that passage, and the first thing that, that jumps out of me is what often we say when he says it's your reasonable service. Well, the translation is your acceptable service. We say two things. Number one, that's our acceptable service. 
you know, that, that's acceptable. And that's the only thing that's acceptable before, before God. But let me also say that I don't like the word reasonable. The reason for that is reason means you thought of, you thought about it. That's your reasonable service. You are, you are no longer transformed by the, uh, you, or you know we're, you're not conformed to this world, but you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see, as you look at it, that's your reasonable, that's something you thought about. It's reasonable. It is reasonable to live that way. Why? Well, let me say that word acceptable, as we said just a minute ago, it is acceptable, and that's the only acceptable way to live. And you know that. Why? Because you thought about it. You've thought about it based on what God has said about it. And that, that very idea, he, when he talks about uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind, it carries with it the idea of that we learn to think like God thinks. That's the idea there, that we, that we learn to think in that way. And then over the book of Colossians, the third chapter, in verse 1. He says, If then you are raised with Christ, sit, uh, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. He says, Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And then he says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. And he mentions several of them. He says, Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry. And then he talks about that those things because of the wrath of God in verse 6. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And then he says that there are some things that we bet that we need to put in the, their place there as well. But we need to understand as Christians that when we make that decision to become a Christian, not as Christians, but as, as we make that decision to become a Christian, that when we do so, we recognize that God is a jealous God. That God will not allow us to continue living our life the way that we live. There are a lot of people that they, they come they come forward, if you will, on Sunday and for whatever reason, you know, whether it is they, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of pressured a little bit, or they do things to kind of get people off their back, or you know, they do it because that's what's expected of them, but they, they're baptized. And everybody, everybody applauds their decision to be baptized, and we always do. I do. I, I'm not saying that we don't, I'm not saying that we should. We applaud that decision. But what happens after that? When temptation starts to come, when all those people that have applauded us, they've left and we're out there and we're going to school with people not understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it and why we won't do what they do and they try to convince us to do it. And sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Do we stop and think, you know, God is a jealous God. <laughs> God wants me to make a conviction God wants me to be convicted. He challenges me in my life every day to live godly. Where you do, what you do, do all in the name of the Lord. Not just to the point of baptism, but our life. Our life needs to have that book, chapter, verse. Every day of our life. What does God want me to do? What does God want me to do? Not what does my buddy want me to do. Not as what my girlfriend want me to do. Or not what even my parents want me to do. What does God want me to do? And that's all that God will be accepted, be acceptable for him. And we better, we better think about it. Because our, our soul hangs in the balance. To the answer that we give in there. Are we going to live for God? Sometimes when people die, and I'm not trying to be negative, but anyway, sometimes when people die, we get together for their funeral and we talk about how faithful they are. But a lot of times when we do that, and I'm not saying, I'm not running anybody, I'm not don't have any, anybody in mind, so don't think I'm trying to say anything. I don't know anyone, but anyway, we what we mean by that is they were faithful with the services. Every time the doors were open, sometimes we would say, 
You know, every time the doors open, you're going to brother so and so or sister so. They came down, they sat in their seat every time. They're here for every gospel meeting, they're here for their Bible class, they're here for every service, they're here, you know, they were here for gospel, they gospel meetings, they're here for Sunday morning Bible class, they're here for Sunday morning worship service, they're here for Sunday night worship service, they're here for Wednesday night worship service, and we had any special classes, they were there. Oh, they were faithful. But what are they all about their life? Now that's a good indication that they had that their life was. Uh, and and I, I, so I want to make sure I say that before I say it. But that's a good indication their life was right. But were they faithful? Did they recognize that their life was to be lived every day the way God would have it? To? And, then, and then as we go through, understand that they have decided then, as we go through our text, that they have decided that no, we're going to we're going to perform. And so there is the resolute resolution. Of a performance, they uh, Joshua comes out and says, "No, you you can't. You need to think about what you did or what you're going to do." And so he says in verse 21, he says, uh, "And the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord.' So Joshua said to the people, you 'Your witness is against yourself, and you will you have chosen the Lord for yourself to serve Him.'" And they all said, "We're witnesses." He said, "Yes, we are going to do it." Now therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and climb your heart to the Lord your, the Lord God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, the Lord our God, we will serve him and his voice will obey. Good decision. They said, yeah, we're going to do it. <clears throat> so they're going to resolve to do that. And so then, last of all, as we look at the last part of the chapter, there's going to be a reminder of that for me. Joshua's going to tell them they need to do something to remind them that they made that commitment. Look at it in verses 25 through 28. In verses 25 through 28, it says, When Joshua made a, made a covenant with the people that day, he made, uh, made them a statue and an order to shepherd. And then Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law, and the book, and, and took a, a large stone and set it under the oak that was the, by the sanctu uh, sanctuary of the Lord, and Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be witness to us, for it has for it has heard all the words of the Lord which He spoke to us. It uh, it shall therefore be a witness to you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, each one to his own inheritance. And so they dispersed there, and we, he goes through through the in verse twenty nine. It says, Now it came to pass that after these days that Joshua the son of Nun served the Lord. He died, and he talks about his, his service and different things. But what I want us to understand here, look, look at, think about for just a minute, is Joshua said, you need to be reminded about this. You made a decision. Unless you forget that decision, we're going we're to set up this stone. We're going we're to let this stone be a witness to you. You know, marriage, for example, we have a marriage certificate. We have a ring. That's a reminder represents other things as well, but that's a reminder of the commitment that we made. We, we have other things that never. He says to that, he says, you, you need to be reminded of this and we're going to set this stone here as, as, an, uh, as, a, as an inheritance that you made this decision. And that's what he says. He says, so Joshua, uh, so, uh, so verse, 20, verse 27, behold, this stone shall be a witness for you. It has heard all, all you've heard of the said of the Lord whom he spoke and it shall be a witness, he says, lest you deny your God. You know what that means to me? If I set a promise, and I deny that promise, and I don't fulfill that promise, and I see that reminder, I feel bad about that. Because you know what? I may say, I made a promise, and I broke that promise. And every time I break that promise, I realize that I lied. I wasn't truthful when I made that promise. And I decide I better, I better, I better do right. And I realize sometimes, I, I, you know, maybe you know, for, for, to people, for example, maybe, maybe there's a loss of, of trust. But with God, we need to make sure that we decide that we're going to live our life. And we may have to suffer some consequences. We may have done some things in the past. And we may have to suffer the consequences of those things that we've done. 
But we need to turn around and we need to serve God. Let me suggest to you, if you go back to the book of Acts, that to us, and we'll just be just a second here. Well, let me say a second, a few minutes. That when we become a Christian, when we make that decision to become a Christian, we have a reminder. Over in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, the, the, the section where he says, Then Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sin. Let me suggest to you that, that one of the, which it goes on, just a go back, but one of the reminders that we have that when we do something wrong, we ought to stop and we oh yeah. Not that it should be anything we really have to think about that hard. Oh yeah, I was baptized into Christ. Oh yeah, I promised God that I wasn't going to do that anymore. Oh yeah, I, I promised God I was going to change my life. And so we, we we're baptized into Christ. We do things that are wrong. We recognize that we have made a promise to God and we understand how serious that is. We realize that is a commitment that we made. That's what's wrong with marriage today, for example. That, that's not a commitment. All I said, we'll, we'll try it. We'll get married, we'll try it. If we don't like it, we'll just, we'll just get a divorce. We'll go through an experiment. You see, there's no thought about the commitments that's there. When we are baptized, we understand that we have entered a commitment to God. And every day of our lives, when we pick up this book right here, and we would say, hey, this is God's word. It teaches me how I need to live. And I better be true to that. I made a commitment. And it is a challenge to me every day of my life to live the way he would have me to. And I ought to feel guilty. And that's not the only reason we make right. We like to make a change. But when I do things that are wrong, I, I feel some sense of guilt. That I've, I've broken my promise to God. And I ought to turn around and I ought to say, God, I get down on my knees and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm going to try my, my best to live better in my life because I made you a promise. And I broke my word and I'll try never to do that again. Go with the book of Re uh, Revelation. Revelation chapter 22. And we'll read this and then we'll bring our lesson to close. In Revelation chapter 22 and verse 7, let me suggest another reminder that we have. Beginning in verse 7, he says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who, come, who keeps the word of the prophecies of this book. Now I, John, saw, the, saw and heard things which I heard and saw. I fell, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel. Who showed me these things? And then he said to me, See that you do that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant, and your brethren, and prophet, and all those who work uh, who, uh, works of this book worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. For he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and, I, and my reward is with me to give, uh, give to everyone according to the according to the word. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who, who do the commandments that they that they may have the right to the tree of life, and uh, uh, my, uh, they may enter through the gates of that city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves the, loves the, the practices lies. I, Jesus, have, have seen my angel to testify to you that these things in the churches and the rude and the offspring of David and the bride and morning star and the spirit and the bride can say come and let them who, who uh, let them who says come and he, let them who thirst come. Whoever desires let him take the waters of life freely. He says, for I testify and everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from these words of the, of the books of the prophecy, God shall take away every word of, 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 of the, apart from the, of the tree of life, from the holy cry, from those things written in the book. 
He who testified of these things said, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come more quickly. Now, there are those who believe that this is dealing with the idea of the, the book of Revelation and the prophecies of that book, and that may very well be so. Uh, but I want us to think of, together about at least what he says at the very end of what the statements. And there are some other things as well. But he says, He who testified these things said, Sure, lines coming quickly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. We make a commitment. And let me suggest, as we think about that commitment that we make, what reminds me every day of that commitment is the promises that God has made to me. That if I live according to the book, whether or not we believe the specific problem there about Revelation or uh, or the rest of the, the book itself. There are other things within the book that teaches us how we ought to live our life on a daily basis. I am reminded daily that God has made me the promise that if I live according to the book, I can go to heaven. And that ought to be enough for each one of us as Christians to make the commitment to say, yes, I am going to live the way God tells me to live every day of my life. And for those who are not Christians, that ought to be enough to say, yes, I'm going to become a Christian. I'm going to be baptized with Christ where I have the hope of heaven. And then I'm going to live my life every day the way God would have me to. And if I falter, if I sin, I'm going to get down on my knees and I'm going to ask God for his forgiveness. I'm going to try my very best to live in that day fall the way God will have Make the commitment today to serve God. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become a Christian and be baptized in Christ for the remission of your sins. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27. That's the only way to get into Christ. We saw there in Acts chapter 2. Peter stood up with the rest of the, the, rest of the apostles and the 11, and he, he told them what they needed to do. I would suggest to you, as we read that, all were in agreement with that. All the apostles, and it's taught to this day. That's the only way to get in Christ today. Always have. If you're here, you need to do that for other reasons. If you have, need to come forward, someone can pray with you for you as you come as you stand and sing. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye vanished, ye weary come, and thou shalt be richly fed. In the temptation, come to live forever Praise God for full salvation. For whosoever will, all things are ready, come to the feast, come for the door is open wide, a place of honor is reserved for you at the master's side.
Appreciate the lesson, Brother Fenner. Uh, <clears throat> if I have to add it to you that if I become a Christian, that this is uh, the easiest thing I've ever done. There's nothing to this. I need to reevaluate uh, where I stand. I, I'm going to tell you, I don't know about you, but being a Christian and being faithful is the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. It's not easy. It's a challenge every day. And the devil wants to take that reward away from us. And we don't need to let that happen. We need to be diligent and understand who he is and where he is and uh, understand that our hope that we have in heaven relies on our being faithful to God. Appreciate the lesson. Look forward to the rest of the lessons this weekend. Again, at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening. Uh, want to remember those we mentioned earlier, some who have uh, uh, been quarantined because of the pandemic, and uh, pray that that will be short lived there. Is there another announcement that a man might have before we're dismissed? If not, go ask Brother Perry Glades to step forward and Word of our closing prayer, and after that prayer, we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we give you our thanks for this day. We thank you for a time such as this when we can come together to be reminded of the things that you've done for us, the things that you expect from us as well. Thank you for Brother Finner and the blessing he's brought. We Pray that you would help us to work toward better commitment, be better examples. We also pray, Heavenly Father, that, that you would forgive us of, of our sins. We are weak and flawed in many ways. We are humble by our sin. We are sorry for it. Pray that you would forgive us and help us to be better. We also continue to pray for those Heavenly Father that are sick with surgery, uh, those that have been exposed to the pandemic, that you bless them with the recovery or a good test return when they will can be able to go back out to the public. Pray that you bless everyone here, especially pray that you would that's Brother Fenner and his family, and not only his work here, but as he works to spread your gospel. Please be with us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.